Seltzer, and I'm with, uh, I'm a member of the CWA uh, Pacific Media Workers Guild and the human rights chair of that uh, local. And I'm also with KPFA Workweek Radio, which one is, is one of the sponsors of this meeting. So I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, this, is, this meeting comes at a very dangerous time uh, for people around the world, and particularly for people in Asia, Korean pen Peninsula. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, the U.S. government has been threatening uh, to have military action against North Korea. And there's a, a great danger of, of world war if that takes place. So at this meeting tonight, we're going to talk about some of the issues behind uh, militarization and the Asian pivot uh, and what that means for, for working people. And I think the first thing people should know about our history is that, unfortunately, the, this uh, situation in, in Korea is not new. Uh, it, it has gone on uh, in it, the struggles in Asia have been going on for many years of U.S. intervention. Uh, in the Korean War, five million people were killed in the Korean War. In the Vietnam War, three million people were killed. And uh, another war would be a major catastrophe for people of Asia and people of the world. And unfortunately, most Americans have a short memory. Uh, a lot of people have forgotten the Vietnam War. Uh, and certainly a lot of people have forgotten the Korean War. And one of the th responsibilities we feel we have is to uh, learn about this history again and the relevance of that history today. And uh, later on, we're going to hear from the Labor Council, the action of the San Francisco Labor Council, which speaks to this issue, uh, not only of militarization, but also what is going on with the situation of defending the comfort women and the establishment of a memorial in San Francisco. Uh, I think that, uh, unfortunately, both uh, the Democrats and Republicans have uh, continued uh, this Asian pivot and the expansion of militarization in Asia and the uh, building of bases in Okinawa and in uh, Jeju, Korea. And for that reason, we believe that the labor movement uh, needs to oppose these, uh, this militarization and also uh, to defend the, the history that is now under assault as well. Because connected to militarization in Asia and particularly the Abe government trying to deny uh, this, the issue of the comfort women uh, and accuse them, in fact, of being prostitutes. That's what they've done. The reality is that countries are trying to change history uh, because they want to militarize. So uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Seito-san and Tadashi uh, Seito-san, and he is with the Dorochiba International Solidarity Committee. Dorochiba is a railroad workers union in Chiba, Japan. He's been here before, and their union is uh, an internationalist union. They believe in international solidarity, and they supported workers here, including the ILWU, when it was locked out, and they've also uh, support the struggle uh, to defend working people and to link up with the workers, uh, not just of the United States, but workers in Korea. So welcome, uh, Seito-san. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm from Dorochiba, a Japanese railroad union. And why I'm here? Yeah. Why railroad workers union is here? It is a very important thing. A uh, railroad comfort women issue is uh, very important for everyone. Yeah, it's true. But especially important for us, Dorochiba. i explain it later. I start from Sister Kim hak -sun. She's a very great woman. But uh, unfortunately, very few Japanese know her name. But I, I want to emphasize that we must respect Kim hak -sun and we must know her life. As you US activists all know, Rosa Parks and other very courageous women. And 
Kim Hak Sung spoke out in 1991. Why 1991? I explain it. In 1980, there was Kwanju uprising, uprising against military dictatorship. And there are many underground organizations organizing efforts, and many were arrested, tortured. But in 1987, there was a great workers' struggle. Strikes and huge demonstrations cornered the military dictator and forced him to issue the democratization statement. That was a huge victory. But also in Japan, in 1980s, Prime Minister Nakasone visited the Yasukuni Shrine, which glorified Japanese militaries, including Class A war criminals. This Prime Minister, Yasukun, <coughs> Yasuhiro Nakasone, was, was the one who established the comfort women system. He established comfort station. Yeah, he boasted in his memoir, I, as a 23-year-old officer, became the leader of thousands of soldiers and made a painstakingly hard effort to establish a comfort station for them. This is the book. And it is deniably <coughs> proved by the uh, evidence. It was uh, oh, Defense Ministry War History Archive by the paymaster. Paymaster means Nakasone. Paymaster special decision, we opened the comfort station and hired the native women into it, and so on. The same Nakasone assaulted railway unions in 1980s. You know, Reagan crushed Nakatepko and Margaret Thatcher assaulted United National Union of Mine Workers. This was the, uh, these assaults were the beginning of neoliberal assault on workers around the world. In Japan, Nakasone privatized national railways. We, Doro Chiba, waged two waves of strikes. In our workplace, riot police seized Tsudanuma train depot, our stronghold of Doro Chiba. After the privatization, Nakasone boasted in a NHK interview. NHK is a um, Japanese equivalent of BBC in UK. I, know that I knew that the privatization would destroy the National Railway Workers Union, which would lead to the demise of a socialist party, and it in turn would open the way for constitutional revision. Constitutional revision means destroying the Article 9 of the Constitution, renunciation of war so-called peace constitution. He wanted to destroy peace constitution through the privatization of national railways. That's that uh, not just a mere uh, union busting. It's a very uh, strategic political act. So, we in railway industry is very keen to 
problem of war, problem of discrimination, and we learned a lot from Kim Hak Sung. So we are very uh, grateful for Kim Hak Sung, and we love her. So, we, this is our video of November rally. This is international rally. And they are Korean dancers. And they are from Railroad Workers United. And German and refugees from around the world. You know, Trump restricts, restricted the number of refugees to 10,000 or so. But in Japan, Abe administration admit. 28, only 28 a year, refugees. So we are fighting against this kind of xenophobia in Japan. And uh, <coughs> oh. and mo more important thing that uh, Korean workers and the people are themselves fighting and they are winning a victory. You know, we participated last November a huge demonstration uh, in Seoul, two million. And this year, they ousted Park Kune. Park Kune was the a, um, a sort of military dictator. Her father was a military dictator who launched a coup d'etat in 1961. And he was a graduate of Japanese military academy. And he is a very good friend of Abe's grandfather. So, Shinzo Abe and Park Kune was a very good friend. The corporate media say that our government and Korean government are crossing over comfort women issue. But this is not true. She and her father were collaborators of Japanese colonial rule. So we workers must unite and forge a solidarity with rank and file of workers and the people of other countries, not a we cannot rely on so-called good 
government, and so on. Now, Korean people ousted Park Geun-hye and new government, Moon Jae-in government, is still detaining almost all of political prisoners. The Korean Confederation <coughs> of Trade Unions president is still in prison. So we workers must overthrow a so-called liberal but oppressive government. Um, and uh, the comfort women issue is not a, a one of the very important issue. It is not not in, not just important, but very vital issue for all of us because uh, um, our government, Abe, is concentrated on this issue, historical denialism. From early 1990s, he always emphasized and concentrated on this issue. About the first <coughs> government in 2006, he revised the fundamental law on education, about education reform, and revised textbook, blacking out workers, working classes struggle for labor rights, denial of history of state oppression workers and their unions, and glorifying of Japanese war against Asian countries and the United States, and denial of, of war crimes. So, we must uh, organize a workers' struggle, and workers' struggle itself have a power to organize. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, to participate in a discussion like this, the, especially with uh, Seito-san. When I was in Japan many years ago, uh, okay. When I, when I was in Japan many years ago, I ended up being locked up by Japanese immigration for 57 days and uh, was deported eventually for anti-war activities and for trying to sail to China on the Quaker yacht Phoenix. Uh, and the Japanese people treated me very well. The government treated me very badly, much like the, our government mis mistreats uh, immig immigrants on such a large scale. Um, my part is to inform you of these two resolutions that Steve has just described uh, on the so-called comfort women and also the resolution to support the May 12th rally at the Korean consulate. Um, we went there in mass to, is that working okay now, yeah. folks? Okay. Uh, we went there to, to demand, to first of all, to congratulate the new president, Moon, and also to... Uh, to demand the release of the unjustly jailed trade unionist and the and political prisoners who'd been in who'd been incarcerated for a long time, even probably before the Park administration jailed the trade unionist. Uh, I'd also like to comment briefly on the on the role of 
unions in this country, uh, I have to admit, or have, I think it's common knowledge, irrefutable, that unions in this country have not been very good on racial issues. And we also haven't been very good in standing up to uh, strongly opposing undeclared interventionist wars. Uh, U.S. labor against the war and some enlightened unionists throughout the country are changing that to some degree, but we have a long way to go. Um, and I'd also like to comment briefly on the anachronistic policy of encircling countries that we consider our enemies. Uh, this is kind of a World War II mentality uh, based on the premise, uh, erroneous premise at this point and in, in, in after so much, so, so such great development in the technology of death and with the intercontinental ballistic missiles and all kinds of and improved aircraft there's no military advantage to encircling our so-called enemies, who aren't our enemies, they're working people like ourselves, um, but that, that doesn't get across. In fact, uh, the, this encirclement uh, provokes people. The, the, for example, Trump in today's paper, uh, there's an article about his meeting with the president of China uh, and, and expecting the Chinese to help resolve the crisis in Korea, in North Korea, uh, at the same time, we're militarizing uh, the countries that will, that we're, we, how can we expect China to cooperate with us when we're working against them in many ways? And, and certainly the Chinese are not going to make the mistake that we made in Iraq and other places in trying to cause a regime change. That's just simply not going to happen. Uh, so I would like to, uh, oh, and, and by the way, the, uh, People have been pointing out that in, in the resolution as well, we, we deal with the THAAD missiles, which Trump says uh, the Koreans, we're imposing it on them, those, that missile system, that the Korean people, uh, the overwhelming majority don't want that system, yet we're imposing it on them, and like the, Mex the wall in Mexico, Trump expects them to pay for this system as well. Uh, so I'd like to... Uh, to read a couple of the whereas's and then the resolution, uh, the resolve part of the resolution on the comfort and women. Whereas the need to have a San Francisco memorial in memory of the comfort women who were sexually enslaved by the Japanese Imperial Army during the Second World War is important to commemorate their suffering and to educate working people and the public about the tragic war, that tragic war crime. Another whereas. The people of Okinawa and Jeju, Korea oppose more military bases that will further militarize Asia, whereas the history of past wars is being censored and sanitized, as Brother as, uh, Seto-san said, by the pro-militarization Abe government in Japan and the Park Chung-hee government uh, in Korea. Both are pushing for militarization and are also representing uh, repressing the democratic and labor rights of workers and the people. Whereas the threat of war in Asia promotes nationalism, racism, and xenophobia in the U.S. and the Asian rim, and whereas the rise of nationalism and racism during World War II led to the incarceration of tens of thousands of Japanese Americans on the West Coast who also lost their property and ended up in detention centers. Whereas the need to remember and apply the lessons of history and build direct links with workers and trade unionists in the Asian rim to stop the growing militarization and threat of war. Therefore, be it resolved that the San Francisco Labor Council support the Comfort Women Memorial in the educational programs in San Francisco and California public schools on that crime of sexual slavery. And therefore, be it resolved that this council oppose the Asian pivot, the TPP, anti-labor trade agreement, and further militarization of Asia, including a new U.S. base in Okinawa and a base in Jeju, Korea, which will be used by the U.S. military, and therefore be it further resolved that this council call for education on these issues and support links to our brothers and sisters in Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and China to build a united workers' movement for labor and human rights and against war. That was the, the resolution that we passed in the fall. And the resolution that we passed on uh, May, uh, in early May, uh, de demanding the release of unjustly, trade unjustly jailed trade unionists 
and the political prisoners. By the way, we had, we've gone to the Korean consulate on several occasions, and this last demonstration, the rally was very different. When we went there in the past, uh, our opponents on this issue would uh, bus large numbers of people, old, uh, Korean senior citizens from the Senior Citizen Center, and pay them to go. In fact, uh, one of them came up to me and said, why don't you go back to North Korea? And I said, well, I haven't been to North Korea. I'd like to go one day. Uh, then and then a, a journalist came up to me, a Korean young woman, Korean journalist, came up and said, uh, are you being paid to be here? She saw my City College AFT 2121 t-shirt. She said, are, are, you being, are you being paid to be here? And I said, no, why would you ask that? And she said, well, the other people here, the people who don't want you here are being paid. <laughs> well, this time it was a, a, a different tone on our part. And, and I might, uh, Seto-san and I might have slightly different views about the hope in Korea now with the election of President Moon. Uh, I'm a little more hopeful than maybe some of my other comrades are. Uh, the resolution in support rally of, to support the rally demanded freedom of unjustly jailed trade unionists in the Republic of Korea, parentheses South Korea. Whereas the former President Park and her government have been impeached for corruption and violating the democratic human and labor rights of the Korean people, whereas teachers and other public service workers have been prevented from joining unions and supporting private uh, public services, and whereas the government has also sought to increase militarization of the country, including the installation of U.S. THAAD missiles, which are opposed by a majority of the people of Korea, as well as the Korean Federation, Confederation of Trade Unionists, KCTU, uh, the, the heroic union that uh, Brother Sato just mentioned. Um, therefore, be it resolved that the San Francisco Labor Council calls for the release of all unjustly jailed trade unionists and political prisoners in the Republic of Korea and an end to the anti-labor regulations and attacks on the right of public workers and other, uh, the right of public teachers and other public workers to organize. And this council endorses a press conference and rally on Friday, May 12th at 12 noon at the San Francisco Republic of Korea consulate and will send a letter to the newly elected leader of the Republic of Korea calling for a release of all the unjustly jailed trade unionists. Um, and we, at, at the end of our demonstration, uh, we went inside and delivered this letter to the consulate to pass to convey to President Moon. Our congratulations to President Moon Jae-in on May 9th, 2017, the people of the Republic of Korea made a heroic uh, I'm sorry, a historic decision to elect a leader who is respected throughout the world for his humanity, vision, and independent judgment. Many of us in this country believe President Moon will free prisoners of conscience and labor leaders who have been jailed unjustly by his predecessor, and that he will fight corruption, respect labor and human rights, and will lead the Korean people toward peace, stability, social, and economic justice. We appreciate President Moon's experience as a human rights lawyer and support his past and future efforts to bring peace and stability to people who have known war and hostility for decades. We admire his, his opposition to militarization and his commitment to defuse the present threat of a nuclear confrontation and to negotiate a lasting peace. President Moon's struggle for peace, social and economic justice may be a difficult one, but the brains and conscience of the entire world will be observing and supporting him. Again, that may be a bit hopeful, but it seems to me that without question, his election is a big step in the right direction. So thank you very much. So I'd like to talk about um, a little bit about like a, the Abe administration and how Abe administration is similar to Trump administration and then uh, implication of denialism in Japan and like how some of the issues in Japan are very similar to what is going on here. And um, so 2006, the first Abe administration, I mean, first Abe administration started and um, at, um, and so like it's like 10 years before the Trump administration and um, in many ways, so like this one, the picture that shows like how conservative our government is, I'm sorry, it's in Japanese, but um, 
by 2014, um, the, actually this is current Abe administration, but 80% of the cabinet member belongs to a very far right organization called Japan Co Conference. And, um, and many of the cabinet members, it's just like a Trump administration, one after another, <laughs> like all the cabinet members are so really like uh, uh, very um, conservative. And, um, um, and so the, the, um, so the Abe administration, like Trump, is using racism, sexism, and also um, racialized sexism in order to kind of um, camouflage and um, in a way address um, the many of the contradictions of the neoliberal economy and the widening um, gaps between poor and the, um, I mean the rich and the impoverished, and also um, the um, and uh, so the, so you know in that context, Abe administration tried to um, deny, as uh, many my um, co-panelists have been talking about, like Abe administration tries to deny um, that many of the uh, wartime uh, Japanese wartime crimes and uh, its uh, tr troubling past, and um, also at the same time. Um, Japan is experiencing intensifying hate speech and uh, racism against the uh, people in Japan. And, um, and then uh, also the remilitarization that is going on. So I'd like to kind of tie both, all these three things and they, they are closely tied together. And um, so the, just to be on the same page, I, I gave uh, a, definition, a definition of Japanese military sexual slavery, if you're not familiar with the uh, comfort women issues, I just, uh, are you familiar with that? So yeah, and then, um, so, um, and um, also here is a def uh, Japanese historical denialism. Um, so the, it's important to note that uh, there is a systematic attempt at permanent erasure of World War II era atrocities, including the Nanjing Massacre and Japanese military sexual slavery, spearheaded by Japan's highest levels of government and the prime minister himself. And the current government is actively working to distort its own troubled past in Japan and around the world, in particular the erasure of comfort women issue. Um, and so forth. And um, it's, it's unthinkable, for example, that if the German government tried to erase, um, to deny the existence of Holocaust, but the, in case of Japan, it's so normalized. And uh, uh, after, you know, the, uh, over 70 years after World War II, the Japanese government is still running out there, denying, and uh, there's, um, um, and so it's, I just want to, um, um, you know, call attention to how unusual and how strange that situation is in some ways, and like, and um, and how outrageous it is, and so so that's what is going on. And then also um, at the same time, there's a lot of hate speech demonstration in Japan, and the, the, many of them are against the Koreans in Japan, um, Danish Koreans in Japan, and um, th those uh, demonstrators say um, in this one. For example, they say, kill Koreans, whether they are good or bad, um, and that kind of very uh, strong wording, and they um, intentionally walk uh, in the neighborhood where many Koreans reside, um, and also uh, they go to, uh, I'll talk about this later, but they go to ethnic Korean schools and uh, got to this kind of a demonstration while students are trying to study inside. Um, and. So, and those are against, those, they do this against uh, Chinese um, people in Japan too, and also uh, many for, uh, foreigners uh, or immigrants in Japan. Um, and so, um, and so, what Abe administration is doing is, you know, on one hand, it is trying to harking back to its imperial past and hallucinating that Japan is, could still continue its hegemony in Asia, like it's total hallucination, but, um, and also at the same time desiring, and desiring to continue current racist and neo-colonial domination against the niche Koreans, Okinawans, Chinese people, Ainu people, black people, etc., etc., all the minorities in Japan, um, and perhaps to try to expand it. And so, um, but, at the same time, after the World War, I mean, it is very different now uh, 
from the time, uh, I mean, before the World War II, uh, I mean, before the end of the World War II. And um, I'd like to argue that um, Abe administration ha has been doing this within the context of what I call trans-Pacific imperialism, which involves not just Japan, Japanese imperialism, but also US imperialism, and also other Asian countries, including like China, China ROK, T Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so this particular system had emerged and developed after the World War II through, throughout the Cold War eras and uh, also still going on right now. And um, so it's, um, and I borrowed this definition from another scholar called Maria Simabuku, who worked on the issue of Okinawa-based struggle. And she said that like, when she tried to understand the issue of Okinawa-based struggle, you can't just talk about Japanese imperialism or US imperialism, but you have to analyze both and how that are affecting um, the people in Okinawa. And especially, um, she said um, here um, that this conceptualization helps us to define simplistic simplistic identification of Japanese as a mere victims of white supremacy or mere victims of West or US. But um, I, I'm quoting uh, Maria Shimabu, she said here by emphasizing that Japanese as victims of white supremacy, uh, transpacifically one might say, he, I mean, this, he's, she's quoting, he neglects to account for how Japan actively used white supremacy to further its project of colonialism toward people in Asia. So, um, so I'm just proposing it's important to look at this intersection of Japanese imperialism and US imperialism and how Japan actually used, in some ways, uh, white supremacy against pe people both in Japan itself but also in many neighboring countries, people in neighboring countries. And also US had interest in um, using Japan to continue its white supremacy and hegemony in Asia as well. So, um, um, and, um, so the rest uh, of the, the, in the talk, I just wanna, um, I'm not, I mean, I, I would need a lot more time to just actually explain this, but uh, I'll just try to give some examples in the rest of the talk to, um, to try to, to make my point. So um, first I'd like to talk a little bit more about comfort women um, denialism. And um, so, um, the, so that, as I said, since the beginning of the Abe cabinet uh, in 2006, so Japan, Japanese government has been taking this official position to deny um, the comfort women system, um, including they also especially emphasize that, that they try to deny that there's any f enforcement, their coercion that was involved. Like they try to claim that all these women were somehow willingly get into the um, atrocity. I mean, it's just very hard to explain because it's very contradict. I mean, very strange, absurd claim. But they try to make that, and um, and then um, in that position, of course, is uh, countering a very intensive uh, and very meticulous scholarship that has been done since uh, at least since early 1990s, and like uh, scholars and activists all over the world, and also UN uh, researchers have established that the control women system is that I mean the um, crime against humanity, and uh, um, we, it's better to be called a Japanese military sexual slavery system rather than comfort women uh, in a, uh, which was a term that was used by the Japanese military in itself. And um, so, but the administration's historical denialism is also a direct response to a fierce and powerful transnational comfort women justice movement led by former comfort women themselves, like including the, um, uh, the um, Kim Hakson that uh, you mentioned. And, um, and um, I'd like to point out that Asian American communities, along with their supporters in the US, have been very central in this transnational movement uh, from the very beginning. And um, they have been leading um, efforts to pass resolutions at both national, state, municipal, community, and organizational levels. Um, in order to demand official apology by the government of Japan. And also they have been memorializing the victims and um, also integrating the history of the Japanese metrosexual slavery system in education, including high school curriculum. 
and um, the more recent um, San Francisco, I mean, court, I, mean I, I, mean, I, I belong to uh, the Come from Women Justice Coalition among, with many uh, people here, um, and that's an, that's one very important uh, effort um, to um, kind of culminating all these uh, movements um, among, um, I mean, led by Asian American communities and supported by many uh, group, I mean, many uh, groups and organizations in this country, um, and um, so. And then, so in reaction to that, Japanese um, government has been engaged in a global campaign to normalize its denialist position through intervening and obstructing the tr all these movements that are happening here and elsewhere. And you might have heard that, that the um, Japanese government is trying to um, intervene um, and I mean, try to get rid of uh, the many statues uh, memorializing for women, like including Glendale, uh, very close to here, and um, um, and many other places, and more recently in Atlanta. Um, and um, so, the so the in order in order to consolidate their positions, the Japanese government has been using. Um, not only consulates and diplomats um, as its local agents, but also they have been closely worked with uh, far right fringe organizations run by recent um, like recent expatriates from Japan, like uh, Japanese people who have immigrated to U.S. And um, so the, those organizations include like uh, organizations that are called happy science and so forth, like the far, really far right organizations whose claims really are very, not very, I mean, are very strange, I mean, they're absurd to just to say that, I mean, that, that and, but they have lots of power because of the support of the Japanese government. And um, the, and also they have collaborated with Japanese media and uh, falsely characterized those movements as hate invoking um, nationalistic revenge by Asian American uh, communities against Japanese or like even Japanese Americans. And um, so the, the Japanese government has been um, like in manipulating past trauma of Japanese Americans, for example, and they try to, um, to find, um, both appeal to and also invoke false sense of victim, victimhood among Japanese people and Japanese Americans. And they claim that all, all these people are attacking Japanese people by creating all these statues. And uh, those are uh, symbols of hate. And it's typical, right? I mean, like, um, it's kind of like, um, it's similar to here, like um, how sometimes um, white guilt works like the, and, the, and um, so it's a, just the just same thing that I think. And um, so the, um, and um, so this, and the most recent um, denialist, I guess, um, the effort, uh, you can see that uh, here in December 2015, uh, Japan and Korea made a bilateral agreement um, and um, it, this is done by um, Japanese foreign minister and also South Korean foreign minister. Like it's a diplomatic agreement about confer women issue, and they left out the victims themselves um, and um, ignored the demands that the victims have been making for over uh, for decades, and uh, they just decided among themselves to s resolve this issue. Um, by, um, for I mean, through just the Japan paying some money, and then, um, but st again, avoiding to make official apology or official reparations or any commitment to educate uh, to, uh, people or um, even to just kind of admit uh, what has happened. And so, in this particular picture, um, Grandma Lee, uh, is one of the Comfort Women and also a uh, act, very fierce activist now, she's kind of um, tried to, um, she's um, speaking to the foreign minister, RK foreign minister, um, and um, pointing out, like, I, I mean, and, um, and criticizing the agreement. And also 
more, more recently, I just mentioned that the Japanese, um, in this case, uh, it happened like a very recently, Japanese diplomat in Atlanta, um, he called the conference women as paid prostitutes, and, um, and also um, he calls conference women a statue, a symbol of hatred and um, resentment against Japan, um, uh, and try to kind of, um, what the, oh, sorry. My time is up. So, uh, sorry about it. <laughs> um, so, the, that, so the, the, those are the examples. And then uh, this is a uh, um, San Francisco Conference Women Justice Coalition when uh, they met in the city hall to pass the resolution for the memorial. Um, and uh, so I think I ran out of time to actually talk about the head speech. You can, so speak, should I? You can, you can speak a few minutes, yeah. Why don't you continue? OK. Um, so I just want to mention, so um, um, because these stories intersect, I just want to talk a little bit about the Korean schools in Japan. And um, Korean schools in Japan is like ethnic studies here. And uh, so there's, there's a long history of organizing and, um, uh, and the Korean, Chinese Koreans, um, created lots of schools in Japan in order to kind of, um, to, um, to, um, I mean, in order to um, raise their children, um, and I mean, if you can, I mean, and uh, I mean, I guess, gave their children uh, opportunities to learn um, Korean history, Korean culture, um, and also, and um, place space where uh, those children could, um, um, be proud of their communities, proud of their um, ancestors, families, etc. In the context that the Jap Japanese Japan and Japanese government were very had been very hostile to the communities, especially Chinese Korean communities who associate themselves closely to North Korea, um, um, but also um, uh, the hatred towards that group is most intense. And uh, so within that context, Korean schools have um, played a very important role um, preserving ethnic space for Danish Koreans. And uh, there's a lot of story, uh, history here, but I'll just uh, skip it. And then, but then recently, um, there's a school in Chiba uh, prefecture, in, it's near Tokyo, and um, there's a Korean school in Chiba. And the mayor of Chiba said that um, well, actually, I have to explain a little bit. So, like in Japan, all the high schools get um, the uh, Jap Japanese government decided that the all, they will uh, make all the high schools free for students, except for Korean schools. So, um, it is the it's it's free for many international schools, like American schools, or even schools for Chinese students, um, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, but they made an exclusion, ex, I mean, the ex, um, ex, made an exception for Korean schools. And, but in, in order to kind of a little bit, I mean, compensate, the Japanese municipalities and governments have been paying some support money um, to that, those schools. But um, a couple of months ago, the mayor of Chiba said they are going to stop the subsidy to the Korean school in Chiba, because um, at the school there's a um, art exhibit, and one of the students who made the uh, one of the students that created the artwork, which critiques the um, bilateral agreement between Korea, South Korea, and Japan, I just talked about, and for that reason, the mayor of Chiba said they cannot offer any support money to the Chiba school anymore. And he added that the school has been very understanding to this um, Korean, I mean, the government mayor, I mean, like a Chiba city has been very understanding this um, school, given the fact that, that there is a huge threat of North Korea. And they are very upset about the Japanese people who are abducted by North Korea. But since the, the 
city has been so understanding to these school, schools, they have been supporting. And this is a betrayal by the school to express this uh, critique of the, you know, the, the Come for Women um, agreement. And then, um, and this hasn't been really, um, so, so I just wanted to add, sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I need to apologize for something. Um, I left my speech in the printer at home. So I tried to jot down my notes, and I'm just hoping I can read them, <laughs> you know, so like that. So I think it's, and it'll be shorter too. <laughs> so um, please bear with me as I try to read what I've written here. But um, I just want to thank you very much for including um, the issue around um, the, Jap the hidden story of the uh, rendition of, of people from Latin America during World War II. And uh, what we are learning from um, the other unfinished World War II business, whether it's from the, sex, uh, from the comfort women uh, or the uh, forced laborers who were enslaved by Imperial Japan, and then also what we're learning about what's um, going on in uh, the Asia now, you know, this threat and the d real danger of war. And this, uh, I think in the discussion so far, we've touched on this, the US strategy of the Asia pivot and um, how it's a kind of t for the United States to gain an all-sided domination in the Asia Pacific region economically, politically, militarily, ideologically. And um, it's for the purpose of um, isolating China as a competitor, and uh, as a competitor to the United States and its allies, and particularly Japan. But it's also, in addition to that, it's a strategy to um, in, enforce that uh, domination uh, through the destabilization of the countries that now um, are in Asia and are uh, surrounding and circling China as well. And this is in the playbook of um, why we're pivoting to Asia is because right now we're in the Middle East and that strategy has kind of played itself out in terms of the destabilization of the countries in that region the terrible, terrible human costs that's happened, the rampant um, militarization that's going on there, and the money that's being made off of it. You know, so I guess uh, part of the um, U.S. strategy as well now just pivot to the Asia and see what um, uh, the United States can do there. And then part of this is because um, the international edu uh, economic competition is really a driving force of the elites of the world to gain influence and domination. And at the same time, they're attacking the living standard of working and poor people. And, um, but thankfully, at the same time, people are rising up to challenge the, uh, repressive regimes and to strive to democratize their governments and empower themselves. And so what we're seeing is a progress of humankind ar around the world to, um, to end, to put an end to this brutal phase of human history, which is characterized by Western colonialism and imperialist domination. So what we're seeing now is how different political forces in the regions and in the different countries are responding to this process. And uh, it actually marks the uh, political tensions among the ruling circles and the populace within our own country here in the United States. So in the United States, the attack uh, against working and poor people comes really down hard, especially on people of color. And um, what we see is also um, the fear, uh, fear of loss of U.S. Um, domination and white supremacy as a main cause of seeing the right wing really uh, gain um, momentum in this country. And uh, we've seen that, um, that evidence by the rise and in increasing acknowledgement of uh, racist attacks, hate speech, hate violence, but also the um, establishment of the Tea Party 
in our Congress and the recent election of Donald Trump and his cronies. Um, and we're also seeing more militarization and the danger of war um, in our own country. Uh, the militarization of our police, the threats of, and act, you know, increased civil strife. And then also we're seeing it play out internationally as well. And, um, and I think this kind of um, increase in militarization is not only because of um, like uh, uh, seeking to destabilize competing elites uh, in the region, let's say in Asia at this time, but it's also the militarization is a, a response to the rising of people power all over the world as well. So um, you may be thinking, well, why, why are we raising Latin America here in a, a, in a panel about Imperial Japan and learning lessons from the comfort women? Well, there's a reason. And part of it is uh, because of the dangers of war and how it spreads out. Uh, and then also, we're learning a lot from each other these unfinished business, uh, justice struggles from World War II. We're learning a lot from each other, uh, not only for our own struggles that are ongoing, but also what it can mean for the challenges that we face today. So I just wanted to um, point out that we talk about this Asia pivot, but it's actually an Asia Pacific pivot. Um, if you recall, for example, the Trans-Pacific um, Partnership, this was kind of like a trade proposal um, which involved around 12 countries, you know, so that it, um, the United States could kind of um, put forward its proposal of integrating and working with, cooperating with different countries in the region. Um, but, and it was part of this Asia uh, Pacific uh, pivot idea strategy. But just to know that among those 12 countries, there were three Latin American countries, including Peru and Chile. So, um, when we talk about um, you know, the threat of war in Asia, we're actually talking about um, recognition of the rising presence of China in the region. China is actually um, expanding its trade relations with numerous countries in Latin America. It's increasing its loans and investments in the area. And um, it's, um, because of the work that it's doing, building relations with other countries in the world um, and in that region, there's, uh, the United States in particular, I think, feels a threat that it may become um, replaced by China uh, influence in the region. So uh, the United States has an interest uh, in the Asia Pacific idea, not only just to contain Asia, uh, China within Asia, but also to recognize um, the growing influence in other parts of the world as well. And so then um, when we talk about the dangers of war increasing in the Asia region, um, for us, that um, lived through World War II or have a very strong interest in what happened then and learning the lesson from then, we know that uh, it was a world war, you know, and that um, also um, by looking at the experience of the peoples in Latin America, we realize how um, uh, the war touched that continent as well, particularly through the policies and strategies of the United States. So I wanted to go through that a little bit uh, because this is a story that people don't really know. Like we may have heard about Japanese American internment and redress, but really few people know that uh, at the same time they were rounding up the Japanese uh, American persons of Japanese ancestry in the US, uh, the United States was also going to Latin America and rounding up, uh, which amounted to over 6,000 men, women, and children of uh, German, Italian, um, even Jewish ancestry and Japanese ancestry. And that was uh, in the name of national security and military necessity, because the uh, people of the, that ancestry, that nationality, were considered the enemy. They were, uh, and they were uh, dangerous 
uh, to the security of the United States and its allies in Latin America. So um, within that, um, about 2,200 uh, of those people that were taken were of Japanese ancestry, uh, both um, citizens of those countries as well as immigrant residents. Um, and so um, what we found was that um, despite the reasoning of national security, what soon became clear was the United States had other interests in mind as well. And, part, and for the Germans in particular, it was to take over businesses and uh, get a uh, stronger economic foothold in Latin America because you know that the United States has always looked to Latin America as its own backyard. It didn't want the competition back there. And then for the Japanese, um, one of the main reasons for scooping up people there was for hostage exchange. So uh, what happened was uh, as uh, you know, the United States is considering whether to enter into World War II, whether it's in Europe or Asia, um, uh, there was a debate going on. And uh, so what we found out was through our research is that prior to even the attack on Pearl Harbor, there were negotiations going on between Japan and the United States that should there be a war uh, that um, citizens of both countries who were caught in the war zone should be able to return home safely. Now you'd think that's a humanitarian program. Civilians should be able to return home safely in times of war because war is something that's fought by soldiers. But no, in this case, a humanitarian program turns into a massive human rights violation program that stretches across two continents. And uh, why that, what happened is that um, there, when the war broke out, there were US citizens in Asia in particular that didn't heed the call of the government to come on home. So you had missionaries, businessmen, tourists, just people who got stuck in the war zone. And so um, the United States found out that it needed uh, people to exchange if they wanted to get their citizens home. Uh, and at first they considered using United, uh, the Japanese in the United States, but they realized that, well, most of them uh, were children, you know, and they were U.S. citizens. So it's kind of contradictory that you would exchange one set of U.S. citizens for another, and the only reason, a big difference would be their um, national ancestry, you know. And so they had to look for bodies elsewhere, and that's why they turned to their own backyard and went to Latin America. And so um, during the war, uh, there were, were at least 4,800 hostages of German, Italian, and Japanese ancestry that were exchanged. And over um, these are over 2,000 of German ancestry and over 2,800 of Japanese ancestry. And of those, um, about over 800 were from Latin America. So um, anyway, just to move things along, at the end of the war, the United States government um, has won the war and now um, has all these remaining interned peoples in camps in, uh, uh, throughout the United States. And these are different camps than the ones you hear about with the Japanese Americans. There's over 50 other detention sites that you don't he usually hear about, run by the Department of Justice and the Army, which house these so-called enemy aliens from the United States as well as from Latin America. So then all of a sudden, these guys are called illegal aliens, the ones that are brought from the, um, Latin America. And then so then they're put onto ships and deported to Europe or to Japan. And uh, for those um, that came from Peru, the Japanese Peruvians, about 300 tried to, to resist deportation, to fight it, because they wanted to go back to their homes in Peru. Um, but initially, Peru would not let them re-enter, even if they were citizens or married to citizens. But eventually, about 100 were able to get back home. So um, these kind of violations happened about 70 years ago or so. 
Well, we, our families, the Japanese, Latin American former internees and their families, have been fighting with the U.S. government for 30 years, trying to get them to acknowledge that what the government did was wrong and that we deserve an apology. We have a right to redress. We um, passed, we tried to get passed two pieces of, of legislation, but they failed in Congress. Ne they never got out of committee. We also, um, uh, instituted five lawsuits that uh, didn't go anywhere because of technical reasons. Um, so in um, 2003, um, three of our um, uh, three brothers called the Shibayama brothers, um, they, they filed a petition with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. This is the only place that people in the United States can go to get redress for the government for wrongdoing by the U.S. government when they can't find uh, justice in the United States, so we filed our petition with this commission, and um, we were surprised it got accepted. An international body recognized, hey, there's something about your claim that rings true. Uh, let's look at it a little more. Well, they've been looking at it for 13 years. <laughs> You know, so um, we asked, well, how come it takes so long? You know, and they said, well, during the normal course of things, we take things in chronological order. You filed in 2003, we're working on cases from 2000 still. So that just goes to show you there's a lot of human rights violations be that are being perpetrated by governments, you know. But we're trying to expedite it because, frankly, most of the people that were taken the older folks, they're gone now. The Shibayama brothers were kids. These war crimes were perpetrated against them when they were children. And so we hope to get uh, pushed for expedited ruling, you know, before everyone's gone. So um, what we do is we ask for people's help, of course. And um, uh, in the back there, there's a petition that we ask people to sign, and it goes to the commission so that we can ask for not only expedited treatment, but also a favorable ruling. And then we ask you, you can either sign the hard copy or go online to sign it. And then we ask you, please share our story with at least three people, somebody in your family, coworker, someone in your church, union member, because the only way that this story is getting out is by word of mouth, um, until maybe the government apologizes and it gets more media coverage. But right now we're depending on um, people like you to help spread the word. And then also, um, I think uh, uh, there's a DVD that we have. So if you really want to know the uh, you know, the details of our history, you can see it. We got a great DVD with a lot of hist historical footage and you'll get to see interviews of some of the internees. Um, but I guess um, where we would like some help is that um, we need your help to um, preserve and defend our history. This is something we learned like in, uh, with the struggle in The Comfort Woman. You know, who ever heard the words historical denialism before? I hadn't, you know? But then what I began to think when I uh, learned about what the uh, Japanese government and the right-wing forces are doing in Japan to hide the history, to uh, suppress it, to um, change it, to whitewash it, you know? And then I got, I got to thinking, well, why isn't that anyone in the United States knows about the Japanese Latin Americans? You know, this history, because it's really a history of World War II style rendition, where the government goes to another country, kidnaps people, takes them to another place for indefinite detention, use them for whatever purpose, and then afterwards, if they're lucky, they get released alive. I mean, we saw that with the revelations of Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib and things like that. So when that came down, we said, ooh, were we subjected to World War II rendition? You know, what's the connection here? And what does that mean that the U.S. government isn't admitting that, oh, what happened around the Iraq war and all? Hey, it happened in World War II. You know, um, and it hasn't ha yet acknowledged and been held accountable for it. So um, we're trying to um, really think about 
what historical denialism means for us. And that's why the only way we can um, protect ourselves right now is to ask for your help to speak loudly and share it so that it doesn't uh, get erased from history. And that another thing is we got to awaken the spirit of justice, of redress justice in the, uh, in the United States. And this is, I, I admit it, it's particularly true within the Japanese American community as, as well. Oftentimes people think, oh, the internment history is over, Japanese Americans got redress, it's a closed story. Well, it isn't, because members of our community have not gotten proper redress. You know, and we got the, the JL, Japanese Latin Americans. It's an ongoing war crime. So what we want to do is re reawaken that spirit of justice and uh, redress justice. And then through this, what we're trying to promote here, especially in the times that we got now, we're not just calling for resistance to all the bad things that the government is doing or what's coming down on us now. We're asking that folks organize and exercise their right to redress and hold the government accountable for its wrongdoing. We got to do more than resist. We got to fight back and uh, get the acknowledgement and the redress that we deserve. And that's not only true for um, the Japanese Latin Americans as an unfinished World War II business issue, but it's also for the, um, the slave laborers, for the comfort women. They also must be de defended in their right to demand government accountability and proper redress. So um, I guess on that note, I'll end. Thanks. Terrorism, many of us um, have learned uh, from the struggles um, uh, among African Americans, black, uh, blacks, and uh, the, I learned a lot from the theories and activism that have been done by the African American communities and blacks in general. And so I think there's a connection. And also, um, when we think about the Japanese um, imperialism and its um, connection to white supremacy, um, we do need to think about uh, anti-black racism in Japan as well. And that is very much tied to what we are trying to do. And so hopefully there's going to be a solidarity um, between those movements um, and uh, there's a lot to I mean, so thank you so much for the comments. Uh, certainly, I thank you for your observation. Uh, I think there's no better uh, symbol of what you describe than the struggle for what black Americans call double V, victory, people who served in the U.S. military, of Af African Americans who served in the U.S. military, risked their lives in war and did very heroic things and came back to a segregated nation. And uh, that, that struggle, double victory, in fact, uh, he, under the Roosevelt administration, one of the uh, publishers of a black newspaper was threatened with being put on trial for treason unless he stopped that campaign demanding double victory until the war ended. So that's a very, very uh, important. In fact, as a nation, we're poor teachers of history and poor students of history not to know about things like that. We're a combination of countries arising in Eurasia that would be competitive to the United States' interests globally. And obviously the two countries are Russia and China. So I personally think that we have to not only comment on China, but also recognize that the demonization of Putin and the assault on, China, on Russia is part of that overall strategy. At the same time, uh, as the U.S. is pursuing uh, both the assault on Russia as well as the pivot to Asia, which is specifically targeting to uh, China, that both China and the United States, excuse me, China and Russia are getting closer and closer together economically, politically, militarily, and strategically. And there's another, a number of different frameworks that this is occurring. Perhaps the most important is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization which you may be familiar with, but it is very, very important. I know the CIA, the Pentagon, and the State Department know clearly about the Shanghai Coordination uh, Organization. Also, the One Road Initiative, or the One Belt, One Road Initiative, which is the new Silk Road strategy, 
both Russia, which is initiated by China, and just this meeting that President Xi had with President Putin just a week ago before the G20 meetings, we see Russia agreeing to cooperate with that initiative, as well as the Russian-dominated uh, Eurasian Economic Union participating in this One Road, uh, One Belt initiative. Also, the BRICS Development Bank, as well as the Chinese-orchestrated Asian Infrastructural Development Bank, are increasingly being linked with Russia and China's interests. There are also coordination related to military strategies aimed at defending China and Russia from U.S. aggression. And so uh, much of the anti russian not much, all of the anti-Russian uh, rhetoric and demonization and the blatant lies that the Russians meddled in the U.S. I, I just, I'm, I'm appalled and I can't take it anymore. This, this stuff claiming that the Russians meddle in the U.S. election uh, is part of this uh, overall demonization that's going on. So we have to realize this is a, a two-track strategy, not just China, but also Russia. And the goal is regime change, is what it is in both countries. And has tried to pay to the corporate women in all sorts of ways. And for example, they established Asian Women's Fund, which is a private fund. And they tried to use it to kind of avoid actually making an official um, reparations. And so there are many kind of um, efforts that Japanese government tries to use in order to make them look like they have done something. And yet, no, until today, there is no reparation that. Um, and so that's part of why these, uh, big, I mean, the survivors who are now in their 90s and um, very old age, they are still um, I mean, struggling, and uh, the, I mean, the, the, those who could, they are traveling all over the world to um, demand, the, and this case, so.